Ancient Greek cuisine was characterized by its frugality, reflecting agricultural hardship. It was founded on the Mediterranean triad, wheat, olive oil, and wine. Modern knowledge of ancient Greek cuisine and eating habits is derived from literary and artistic evidence. The literary evidence comes mostly from Aristophanes' comedies and quotes preserved by 2nd-3rd century AD grammarian Athenius, while artistic information is provided by black and red figure vase painting and terracotta figurines. Meals At home The Greeks had three to four meals a day. Breakfast, akratismos akratismos, consisted of barley bread dipped in wine, akratos akratos, sometimes complemented by figs or olives. They also ate pancakes called tegonites tegonites, tagonites tagonites, or tagenius tagenius, all words deriving from tagenon, tagenon, frying pan. The earliest attested references on tagenius are in the works of the 5th century BC poets Cratinus and Magnus. Tagonites were made with wheat flour, olive oil, honey and curdled milk, and were served for breakfast. Another kind of pancake was statites, statites, from statinos, statinos, a flour or dough of spelt, derived from stace, stace, flour of spelt. Athenius in his Dipnosophisti mentions statitas topped with honey, sesame and cheese. A quick lunch Ariston, Ariston, was taken around noon or early afternoon. Dinner, Dipnon Dipnon, the most important meal of the day, was generally taken at nightfall. An additional light meal, Hesperisma Hesperisma, was sometimes taken in the late afternoon. Aristodapnon Aristodapnon, literally, lunch dinner was served in the late afternoon instead of dinner, men and women took their meals separately. When the house was too small, the men ate first, the women afterwards. Slaves waited at dinners. Aristotle notes that the poor, having no slaves, would ask their wives or children to serve food. Respect for the father who was the breadwinner was obvious, the ancient Greek custom of placing terracotta miniatures of their furniture in children. S. Graves gives us a good idea of its style and design. The Greeks normally ate while seated on chairs, benches were used for banquets. The tables, high for normal meals and low for banquets, were initially rectangular in shape. By the 4th century BC, the usual table was round, often with animal-shaped legs, for example lion. S. Paws. Loaves of flat bread could be used as plates, but terracotta bowls were more common, dishes became more refined over time, and by the Roman period plates were sometimes made out of precious metals or glass. Cutlery was not often used at the table, use of the fork was unknown, people ate with their fingers. Knives were used to cut the meat. Spoons were used for soups and broths. Pieces of bread apomagdalia, apomagdalia, could be used to spoon the food or as napkins to wipe the fingers. Social dining As with modern dinner parties, the host could simply invite friends or family, but two other forms of social dining were well documented in ancient Greece, the entertainment of the all-male symposium, and the obligatory, regimental sisitia. Symposium The symposium, symposium symposium, traditionally translated as banquet, but more literally Gathering of drinkers was one of the preferred pastimes for the Greeks. It consisted of two parts, the first dedicated to food, generally rather simple, and a second part dedicated to drinking. However, wine was consumed with the food, and the beverages were accompanied by snacks tragamata, tragamata, such as chestnuts, beans, toasted wheat, or honey cakes, all intended to absorb alcohol and extend the drinking spree. The second part was inaugurated with a libation, most often in honor of Dionysus, followed by conversation or table games, such as katabos. The guests would recline on couches, klinai klinai, low tables held the food or game boards. Dancers, acrobats, and musicians would entertain the wealthy banqueters. A. King of the banquet was drawn by lots, he had the task of directing the slaves as to how strong to mix the wine, with the exception of courtesans, the banquet was strictly reserved for men. It was an essential element of Greek social life. Great feasts could only be afforded by the rich, in most Greek homes, religious feasts or family events were the occasion of more modest banquets. The banquet became the setting of a specific genre of literature, giving birth to Plato's Symposium, Xenophon. 
S. Work of the Same Name, The Table Talk of Plutarch's Moralia, and the Dipnosophists, Banquet of the Learned, of Athenius. Sisitia the sisitia, ta sisitia, ta sisitia, were mandatory meals shared by social or religious groups for men and youths, especially in Crete and Sparta. They were referred to variously as heteria, phaeditia, or andrea, literally, belonging to men. They served as both a kind of aristocratic club and as a military mess. Like the symposium, the sisitia was the exclusive domain of men, although some references have been found to substantiate all female sisitia. Unlike the symposium, these meals were hallmarked by simplicity and temperance. Foodstuffs Bread Cereals formed the staple diet. The two main grains were wheat cito -citos, and barley crid -crid. In ancient Greece, bread was served with accompaniments known as opsin opsin, sometimes rendered in English as relish. This was a generic term which referred to anything which accompanied this staple food, whether meat or fish, fruit or vegetable. Wheat Wheat grains were softened by soaking, then either reduced into gruel, or ground into flour aliata aliata, and kneaded and formed into loaves artos artos, or flatbreads, either plain or mixed with cheese or honey. Leavening was known, the Greeks later used an alkali nitron nitron, and wine yeast as leavening agents. Dough loaves were baked at home in a clay oven, ipnos ipnos, set on legs, bread wheat, difficult to grow in Mediterranean climates, and the white bread made from it, were associated with the upper classes in the ancient Mediterranean, while the poor ate coarse brown breads made from emmer wheat and barley. A simpler baking method involved placing lighted coals on the floor and covering the heap with a dome-shaped lid, negius negius, when it was hot enough, the coals were swept aside, and dough loaves were placed on the warm floor. The lid was then put back in place, and the coals were gathered on the side of the cover. This method is still traditionally used in Serbia and elsewhere in the Balkans, where it is called crepola or sack. The stone oven did not appear until the Roman period. Solon, an Athenian lawmaker of the 6th century BC, prescribed that leavened bread be reserved for feast days. By the end of the 5th century BC, leavened bread was sold at the market, though it was expensive. Barley Barley was easier to produce but more difficult to make bread from. It provided a nourishing but very heavy bread. Because of this it was often roasted before milling, producing a coarse flour, alfida alfida, which was used to make maza maza, the basic Greek dish. Many recipes for maza are known, it could be served cooked or raw, as a broth, or made into dumplings or flatbreads. Like wheat breads, it could also be augmented with cheese or honey. In peace, Aristophanes employs the expression esthian krithas monas, literally, to eat only barley, with a meaning equivalent to the English, diet of bread and water. Fruit and vegetables In ancient Greece, fruit and vegetables were a significant part of the diet, as the ancient Greeks consumed much less meat than is usual today. Legumes would have been important crops, as their ability to replenish exhausted soil was known at least by the time of Xenophon, as one of the first domesticated crops to be introduced to Greece. Lentils are commonly found at archaeological sites in the region from the Upper Paleolithic. Vegetables were eaten as soups, boiled or mashed, etnos etnos, seasoned with olive oil, vinegar, herbs or garan garan, a fish sauce similar to Vietnamese nook mam. In the comedies of Aristophanes, Heracles was portrayed as a glutton with a fondness for mashed beans. Poor families ate oak acorns, balanoi balanoi. Raw or preserved olives were a common appetizer. In the cities, fresh vegetables were expensive, and therefore, the poorer city dwellers had to make do with dried vegetables. Lentil soup fake fake was the workman's typical dish. Cheese, garlic, and onions were the soldier's traditional fare. In Aristophanes, Peace, the smell of onions typically represents soldiers, the chorus, celebrating the end of war, sings oh, joy, joy. No more helmet, no more cheese nor onions. Bitter vetch oribos oribos, was considered a famine food, fruits, fresh or dried, and nuts, were eaten as dessert. Important fruits were figs, raisins, and pomegranates. In Athenaeus' Dipnosophisti, he describes a dessert made of figs and broad beans. 
Dried figs were also eaten as an appetizer or when drinking wine. In the latter case, they were often accompanied by grilled chestnuts, chickpeas, and beech nuts. Fish and meat The consumption of fish and meat varied in accordance with the wealth and location of the household. In the country, hunting, primarily trapping, allowed for consumption of birds and hares. Peasants also had farmyards to provide them with chickens and geese. Slightly wealthier landowners could raise goats, pigs, or sheep. In the city, meat was expensive except for pork. In Aristophanes' day a piglet cost three drachmas, which was three days' wages for a public servant. Sausages were common both for the poor and the rich. Archaeological excavations at Cavusi Castro, Lerna, and Castanas have shown that dogs were sometimes consumed in Bronze Age Greece, in addition to the more commonly consumed pigs, cattle, sheep, and goats. In the 8th century BC, Hesiod describes the ideal country feast in works and days. Meat is much less prominent in texts of the 5th century BC onwards than in the earliest poetry, but this may be a matter of genre rather than real evidence of changes in farming and food customs. Fresh meat was most commonly eaten at sacrifices, though sausage was much more common, consumed by people across the economic spectrum. Spartans primarily ate a soup made from pig's legs and blood, known as milos zomos, malas zomos which means black soup. According to Plutarch, it was so much valued that the elderly men fed only upon that, leaving what flesh there was to the younger. It was famous amongst the Greeks. Naturally Spartans are the bravest men in the world," joked a Sybarite. Anyone in his senses would rather die ten thousand times than take his share of such a sorry diet. It was made with pork, salt, vinegar and blood. The dish was served with maza, figs and cheese sometimes supplemented with game and fish. The second third century author Alien claims that Spartan cooks were prohibited from cooking anything other than meat. In the Greek islands and on the coast, fresh fish and seafood, squid, octopus, and shellfish were common. They were eaten locally but more often transported inland. Sardines and anchovies were regular fare for the citizens of Athens. They were sometimes sold fresh, but more frequently salted. A steel of the late 3rd century BC from the small Boeotian city of Acryphia, on Lake Cope, provides us with a list of fish prices. The cheapest was scarin, probably parrotfish, whereas Atlantic bluefin tuna was three times as expensive. Common salt water fish were yellowfin tuna, red mullet, ray, swordfish or sturgeon, a delicacy which was eaten salted. Lake Cope itself was famous in all Greece for its eels, celebrated by the hero of the Acharnians. Other fresh water fish were pike fish, carp and the less appreciated catfish. In classical Athens, eels, conger eels, and sea perch orphos were considered to be great delicacies, while sprats were cheap and readily available. Eggs and dairy products Greeks bred quails and hens, partly for their eggs. Some authors also praise pheasant eggs and Egyptian goose eggs, which were presumably rather rare. Eggs were cooked soft or hard-boiled as or d. Ouvre or dessert. Whites, yolks and whole eggs were also used as ingredients in the preparation of dishes. Country dwellers drank milk, gala gala, but it was seldom used in cooking. Butter, butyrin buturon, was known but seldom used either. Greeks saw it as a culinary trait of the Thracians of the northern Aegean coast, whom the middle comic poet Anaxandrides dubbed butter eaters. Yet Greeks enjoyed other dairy products. Pyreot pyreot and oxygala, oxygala were curdled milk products, similar to cottage cheese or perhaps to yogurt. Most of all, goat's and u's cheese tyros tyros was a staple food. Fresh and hard cheese were sold in different shops, the former cost about two-thirds of the latter's price. Cheese was eaten alone or with honey or vegetables. It was also used as an ingredient in the preparation of many dishes, including fish dishes. The only extant recipe by the Sicilian cook Mythicus runs. Tania, gut, discard the head, rinse and fillet, add cheese and olive oil. However, the addition of cheese seems to have been a controversial matter. Archistratus warns his readers that Syracusan cooks spoil good fish by adding cheese. Drink the most widespread drink was water. Fetching water was a daily task for women. 
Though wells were common, spring water was preferred, it was recognized as nutritious because it caused plants and trees to grow, and also as a desirable beverage. Pindar called spring water as agreeable as honey. The Greeks would describe water as robust, heavy or light, dry, acidic, pungent, wine-like, etc. One of the comic poet Antiphanes's characters claimed that he could recognize Attic water by taste alone. Athenius states that a number of philosophers had a reputation for drinking nothing but water, a habit combined with a vegetarian diet cf. below. Milk, usually goats. Milk was not widely consumed, being considered barbaric. The usual drinking vessel was the skyphos, made out of wood, terracotta, or metal. Critias also mentions the kothon, a Spartan goblet which had the military advantage of hiding the color of the water from view and trapping mud in its edge. The ancient Greeks also used a vessel called a kylix, a shallow-footed bowl, and for banquets the cantheros, a deep cup with handles, or the riton, a drinking horn often molded into the form of a human or animal head. Wine The Greeks are thought to have made red as well as rosé and white wines. Like today, these varied in quality from common table wine to valuable vintages. It was generally considered that the best wines came from Thassos, Lesbos and Chios. Cretan wine came to prominence later. A secondary wine made from water and pumice, the residue from squeezed grapes, mixed with lees, was made by country people for their own use. The Greeks sometimes sweetened their wine with honey and made medicinal wines by adding thyme, pennyroyal and other herbs. By the first century, if not before, they were familiar with wine flavored with pine resin, modern retsina. Alien also mentions a wine mixed with perfume. Cooked wine was known, as well as a sweet wine from Thassos, similar to port wine. Wine was generally cut with water. The drinking of Akraton or unmixed wine, though known to be practiced by northern barbarians, was thought likely to lead to madness and death. Wine was mixed in a crater, from which the slaves would fill the drinker's kylix with an inakawi, jugs. Wine was also thought to have medicinal powers. Alien mentions that the wine from Heria in Arcadia rendered men foolish but women fertile. Conversely, Achaean wine was thought to induce abortion. Outside of these therapeutic uses, Greek society did not approve of women drinking wine. According to Alien, a Massilian law prohibited this and restricted women to drinking water. Sparta was the only city where women routinely drank wine. Wine reserved for local use was kept in skins. That destined for sale was poured into pithoi pithoi, large terracotta jugs. From here they were decanted into amphoras sealed with pitch for retail sale. Vintage wines carried stamps from the producers or city magistrates who guaranteed their origin. This is one of the first instances of indicating the geographical or qualitative provenance of a product. Kaikon The Greeks also drank kaikon, kaikon from kaikau kaikau, to shake, to mix, which was both a beverage and a meal. It was a barley gruel, to which water and herbs were added. In the Iliad, the beverage also contained grated goat cheese. In the Odyssey, Circe adds honey and a magic potion to it. In the Homeric hymn to Demeter, the goddess refuses red wine but accepts a kaikon made of water, flour, and pennyroyal, used as a ritual beverage in the Eleusinian mysteries. Kaikon was also a popular beverage, especially in the countryside. Theophrastus, in his characters, describes a boorish peasant as having drunk much kaikon and inconveniencing the assembly with his bad breath. It also had a reputation as a good digestive, and as such, in peace, Hermes recommends it to the main character who has eaten too much dried fruit. Cultural beliefs about the role of food Food played an important part in the Greek mode of thought. Classicist John Wilkins notes that, In the Odyssey for example, good men are distinguished from bad and Greeks from foreigners partly in terms of how and what they ate. Herodotus identified people partly in terms of food and eating. Up to the 3rd century BC, the frugality imposed by the physical and climatic conditions of the country was held as virtuous. The Greeks did not ignore the pleasures of eating, but valued simplicity. The rural writer Hesiod, as cited above, spoke of his flesh of a heifer fed in the woods, that has never calved, and of firstling kids, as being the perfect closing to a day. 
Nonetheless, Chrysippus is quoted as saying that the best meal was a free one. Culinary and gastronomical research was rejected as a sign of oriental flabbiness. The inhabitants of the Persian Empire were considered decadent due to their luxurious taste, which manifested itself in their cuisine. The Greek authors took pleasure in describing the table of the Achaemenid great king and his court. Herodotus, Clearchus of Soli, Strabo and Tejas were unanimous in their descriptions. In contrast, Greeks as a whole stressed the austerity of their own diet. Plutarch tells how the king of Pontus, eager to try the Spartan black gruel, bought a Laconian cook but had no sooner tasted it than he found it extremely bad, which the cook observing, told him, Sir, to make this broth relish, you should have bathed yourself first in the river Eurotas. According to Polyenus, on discovering the dining hall of the Persian royal palace, Alexander the Great mocked their taste and blamed it for their defeat. Pausanias, on discovering the dining habits of the Persian commander Mardonius, equally ridiculed the Persians who having so much, came to rob the Greeks of their miserable living." In consequence of this cult of frugality, and the diminished regard for cuisine it inspired, the kitchen long remained the domain of women, free or enslaved. In the classical period, however, culinary specialists began to enter the written record. Both Alien and Athenius mention the thousand cooks who accompanied Smindiride of Sybaris on his voyage to Athens at the time of Cleisthenes, if only disapprovingly. Plato in Gorgias, mentions the Arian the cook, Mythicus the author of a treatise on Sicilian cooking, and Sarambos the wine merchant, three eminent connoisseurs of cake, kitchen and wine. Some chefs also wrote treatises on cuisine. Over time, more and more Greeks presented themselves as gourmets. From the Hellenistic to the Roman period, the Greeks, at least the rich, no longer appeared to be any more austere than others. The cultivated guests of the feast hosted by Athenius in the 2nd or 3rd century devoted a large part of their conversation to wine and gastronomy. They discussed the merits of various wines, vegetables, and meats, mentioning renowned dishes, stuffed cuttlefish, red tuna belly, prawns, lettuce watered with mead, and great cooks such as Soterides, chef to King Nicomedes I of Bithynia, who reigned from the 279 to 250 BC. When his master was inland, he pined for anchovies, so Tarides simulated them from carefully carved turnips, oiled, salted and sprinkled with poppy seeds. Suitas, an encyclopedia from the Byzantine period, mistakenly attributes this exploit to the celebrated Roman gourmet Apicius, 1st century BC, which may be taken as evidence that the Greeks had reached the same level as the Romans. Specific diets Vegetarianism Orphicism and Pythagoreanism, two common ancient Greek religions, suggested a different way of life, based on a concept of purity and thus purification catharsis catharsis, a form of asceticism in the original sense, ascesis ascesis initially signifies a ritual, then a specific way of life. Vegetarianism was a central element of Orphicism and of several variants of Pythagoreanism. Empedocles, 5th century BC, justified vegetarianism by a belief in the transmigration of souls, who could guarantee that an animal about to be slaughtered did not house the soul of a human being? However, it can be observed that Empedocles also included plants in this transmigration, thus the same logic should have applied to eating them. Vegetarianism was also a consequence of a dislike for killing. For Orpheus taught us rights and to refrain from killing. The information from Pythagoras 6th century BC, is more difficult to define. The comedic authors such as Aristophanes and Alexis described Pythagoreans as strictly vegetarian, with some of them living on bread and water alone. Other traditions contented themselves with prohibiting the consumption of certain vegetables, such as the broad bean, or of sacred animals such as the white cock or selected animal parts. It follows that vegetarianism and the idea of ascetic purity were closely associated, and often accompanied by sexual abstinence. In On the Eating of Flesh, Plutarch 1st, 2nd century, elaborated on the barbarism of blood spilling, inverting the usual terms of debate, he asked the meat-eater to justify his choice. The Neoplatonic Porphyrius 3rd century associates in On Abstinence vegetarianism with the Cretan mystery cults, and gives a census of past vegetarians, starting with the semi-mythical Epimenides. 
For him, the origin of vegetarianism was Demeter's gift of wheat to Triptolemus so that he could teach agriculture to humanity. His three commandments were, Honor your parents. Honor the gods with fruit. And, Spare the animals. Athlete diets Alien claims that the first athlete to submit to a formal diet was Icos of Tarentum, a victor in the Olympic pentathlon perhaps in 444 BC. However, Olympic wrestling champion, 62nd through 66th Olympiads, Milo of Croton was already said to eat 20 pounds of meat and 20 pounds of bread and to drink 8 quarts of wine each day. Before his time, athletes were said to practice xerophagia xerophagia from zeros zeros. Dry. A diet based on dry foods such as dried figs, fresh cheese and bread. Pythagoras, either the philosopher or a gymnastics master of the same name, was the first to direct athletes to eat meat. Trainers later enforced some standard diet rules, to be an Olympic victor. You have to eat according to regulations, keep away from desserts, you must not drink cold water nor can you have a drink of wine whenever you want. It seems this diet was primarily based on meat, for Galen, ca. 180 AD, accused athletes of his day of always gorging themselves on flesh and blood. Pausanias also refers to a meat diet. See also Byzantine cuisine Greek cuisine List of ancient dishes Nutrition in classical antiquity Notes References Bryant, P. Histoire de l'Empire Perse de Cyrus à Alexander. Paris, Fayard, 1996. ISBN 2-213-59667-0, translated in English as From Cyrus to Alexander, A History of the Persian Empire. Winona Lake, Eind, Eisenbrowns, 2002 ISBN 1-57506-031-0. Dalby, A Siren Feasts, A History of Food and Gastronomy in Greece. London, Routledge, 1996. ISBN 0-415-15657-2 Davidson, James, 1993. Fish, Sex and Revolution in Athens. The Classical Quarterly. 43, 1. Dodds, E. R. The Greek Shamans and the Origins of Puritanism. The Greek and the Irrational, Sather Classical Lectures. Berkeley, University of California Press, 1962, first edn 1959. Flassilier R. La vie quotidienne en Grise aux temps de Pericles. Paris, Hachette, 1988, first edn. 1959, ISBN 2-01-005966-2, translated in English as Daily Life in Greece at the Time of Pericles. London, Phoenix Press, 2002 ISBN 1-84212-507-9 Flint Hamilton, K. B. Legumes in Ancient Greece and Rome, Food, Medicine, or Poison? Hesperia, Vol. 68, No. 3, July, Sep, 1999, pp. 371-385. Mijo, L., L'Economie des Cités Grecs. Paris, Ellipses, 2002 ISBN 2-7298-0849-3, in French. Snyder, Lynn M., Klippel, Walter E., 2003. From Lerna to Castro, Further Thoughts on Dogs as Food in Ancient Greece, Perceptions, Prejudices, and Reinvestigations. British School at Athens Studies, 9. Sparks, B. A. The Greek Kitchen. The Journal of Hellenic Studies, Vol. 82, 1962, 1962, pp. 121-137. Wilkins, J., Harvey, D. and Dobson, M. Food in Antiquity. Exeter, University of Exeter Press, 1995. ISBN 0-85989-418-5. Further reading External links In French
Vegetarism, O Commencement, French language article on the origins of vegetarianism. A Taste of the Ancient World, University of Michigan. Ancient Greek Recipes and Posts about Ancient Greek Cuisine